okay so this gets us back to question number 56 we have already discussed the gross it was the image of fibrinous pericarditis what it shows are thin strands what it shows are thin strands of fibrinous exudate it showed us thin strands of fibrinous exudate that extended that extended from pericardial from epicardial to the pericardial surface that extended that extended from epicardial surface from epicardial to the pericardial sac epicardial surface to the pericardial sac this we have already seen this is the classical feature of fibrinous pericarditis and unfortunately has to be remembered next this gets us to the next question that is question number 57 question 57 which cell will increase in case of parasitic infection now before we go further let us type the cells cell a is a lymphocyte cell b is a neutrophil c is an eosinophil and d is a basophil so which will increase in parasitic infections eosinophils so the answer is c that is eosinophils the answer is c that is eosinophils easy easy next this gets us to the next question that is question 58 this gets us to question 58 64 year male died due to road traffic accident his vessels show the following clots these are the chicken fat this looks like chicken fat these are the chicken fat thrombus so let let us see this in more detail so starting with question 58 so question 57 the answer was c that is eosinophils which were marked as c and next coming to question number 58 the answer is b that is chicken fat thrombus the answer is b that is chicken fat thrombus so let us look at this in more detail <coughs> thrombus I can divide this into two types <coughs> I can divide the thrombus into two types arterial thrombi and venous thrombi arterial thrombus and venous thrombus arterial and venous first point arterial thrombi the, the blood flow this the, the blood flow is turbulent flow or it occurs because of cause this is either because of turbulent flow or at the site of endothelial injury or this occurs at the site of endothelial injury at the site of endothelial injury this is an arterial thrombus versus venous thrombi which occur at sites of stasis which occurs at sites of stasis of blood next point next point propagation of the thrombus propagation of the thrombus it goes towards heart it goes towards heart so in arterial thrombus the propagation is towards the heart that is retrograde retrograde whereas in venous it is in the direction of blood flow that is antigrade easy to remember it is towards the heart propagation next next arterial thrombus it does not occlude the vessel this does not occlude the vessel whereas here 
occlusion of vessel is seen venous thrombus occlusion of vessel is seen next point sites sites the sites for anti for the sites for arterial thrombus are coronary arteries coronary followed by cerebral followed by femoral followed by femoral so the sites of thrombi coronary cerebral femoral versus venous thrombi which occurs in lower extremities versus the venous thrombi which occurs in lower extremities most commonly most commonly that is the deep vein thrombosis of the legs followed by followed by upper extremities followed by upper extremities and periprostatic plexus that is around the prostate periprostatic periprostatic plexus these are the sites arterial versus venous thrombus next point grossly grossly this again is important grossly arterial thrombus they are the white thrombi they are the white thrombi why because here there are more platelets versus venous thrombus which are the red thrombi because they have more red cells more rbcs or more red cells are present here venous thrombus last point last point both arterial and venous thrombus as a general rule are associated with laminations both arterial and venous thrombus are associated with laminations which are called as lines of zan which are called as lines of zan these these lines of zan why are they formed they are they are pale platelets these these are pale and dark areas the pale are platelets pale areas are platelets and fibrin deposits pale areas in lines of zan are platelets and fibrin deposits and the darker rich and the darker ones are the red cell rich layers red cell rich layers so these pale and dark areas they alternate with each other these pale dark pale dark they alternate with each other giving rise to the classical laminations called as lines of zan next point these lines of zan they distinguish they distinguish an antemortem clot distinguish an antemortem clot from postmortem clot lines of zan they distinguish an antemortem from a postmortem clot next point next point postmortem clots on the other hand so let us see few features of postmortem clots postmortem clots on the other hand they are gelatinous in nature postmortem clots they are gelatinous in nature with yellow the dark dependent red portion with a dark red dependent red portion dark dependent red portion that is here the rbcs have settled by gravity rbcs have settled by gravity because of the gravity the rbcs have settled down giving rise to a dark dependent portion and the upper portion is yellow fat with an upper yellow chicken fat portion upper 
येलो चिकन फैट पोशन अपर येलो चिकन फैट पोशन दिस इज अ पोस्ट मॉर्टम क्लॉट दिस इज अ पोस्ट मॉर्टम क्लॉट एंड ऑब्वियसली अ पोस्ट मॉर्टम क्लॉट दिस इज नॉट अटैच दिस इज नॉट अटैच टू द वेसल वॉल इट इज नॉट अटैच टू द अंडरलाइन वेसल वॉल दिस इज एंटीमॉर्टम वर्सेज पोस्टमार्टम ब्लड क्लॉट्स सो बिफोर आई गो फर्दर let us have a look at the image again we have the dark red dependent portion with upper chicken white that is a post mortem clot that is a chicken fat or thrombus or a post mortem clot next this gets us to question number 59 cml is characterized by leukocytosis fair enough thrombocytosis okay increased serum vitamin b12 fair enough but increased lab score no extremely important extremely important question 59 the answer is c in cml lab score is reduced it is not increased so it is characterized by all except an increased lab score so before we go further let us see the features of cml let us see the features of chronic myeloid leukemia cml first point starting with peripheral smear they show a high tlc high tlc with what do we mean by high tlc normal tlc of a, of an adult is 4 to 11000 here the tlc is markedly increased let us assume it to be 90000 to 1 lakh high tlc with presence of with presence of immature myeloid precursors with presence of immature myeloid precursors in peripheral blood what do we mean by immature myeloid precursors this is classically called as shift to left cml it is characterized by shift to left what does this mean let us leave one line below this and then write shift to left means all the cells they originate from plus so how does the normal neutrophil mature it starts from a blast goes to the promyelocyte stage promyelocyte myelocyte metamyelocyte blast promyelocyte metamyelocyte band form and neutrophil band form and neutrophil this is how blast matures i have written it left to right so if i count 100 cells in a patient of cml i will see everything i'll see 7 plus 8 promyelo 14 myelo 9 metamyelo 10 band form 16 neutrophils along with lymphocytes monocytes and basophils so presence of all the immature cells that is blast promyelo myelo metamyelo whatsoever is called as shift to left peripheral smear this is a basic point in cml next point cml it is also associated with basophilia that is basophils are increased in cml this is the peripheral smear picture of cml with respect to leukocytes next point rbc morphology which rbc disorder is cml associated with cml it can be associated with it can be associated with warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia it can be associated with warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia and autoimmune hemolytic anemia is associated with the presence of spherocytes it is associated with the presence of spherocytes next point ah uh, my mistake let me rephrase this firstly we have seen the peripheral smear picture of cml high tlc with shift to left with basophilia next point 
though it can be associated with spherocytes, but the most characteristic, this is again asked, spherocytes of warm type autoimmune hemolytic anemia, the most characteristic neoplasm or the most common neoplasm associated with this is CLL, not CML, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So, in case asked about spherocytes, please mark it exclusively with CLL. You can forget CML in this case. Next point, next point, CML. Now, can I easily say that high TLC, can I say high TLC with shift to left? This is characteristic of CML, that is if I have a patient with this, can I put my signature as CML? No. It is also seen in leukamoid reaction, high TLC with shift to left, CML versus leukamoid reaction. Both have a high TLC, both with shift to the left, but they are different entities. CML is a blood cancer, leukamoid reaction is seen in infections, prognosis is markedly different. How do we differentiate? TLC is markedly increased in CML whereas it is just increased in leukamoid reaction, it is not markedly elevated. Next point, BLAS, BLAS, they are present in CML versus absent in leukamoid reaction, but the main differentiating feature between the two is lab score, leukocyte alkaline phosphatase score which is reduced in CML whereas increased in leukamoid reaction, extremely important, extremely important. So, CML is characterized by increased lab score is false, it is reduced in CML. Next point, this gets us to lab score. Suppose I have a patient with reduced lab score. Can I put my signature on the report that he is suffering from CML? No. So, let us make a table of lab score reduced versus elevated, low versus high. Low lab score other than CML is also seen in PNH, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, PNH versus high lab score which is seen in leukamoid reaction, leukamoid reaction, Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukamoid reaction, Hodgkin's lymphoma, PV that is polycythemia vera, PV and CMLN blast crisis. So, please note the examiner had asked you CML not CML and blast crisis. So, the answer is CML, CML. Next point, highest lab score. These are the causes of high lab score. Out of these, highest lab score is seen in PV. Highest lab score is seen in PV, polycythemia vera. Done. This gets us to the next question that is question 60. This gets us to the next one <coughs> that is question number 60. Given type of leukemia is not characterized by, now first have a look, it shows the presence of a hairy cell, cell with cytoplasmic hairy cell hairy projections. So, this is a case of hairy cell leukemia and hairy cell leukemia is not characterized by lymphadenopathy. So, the answer is C that is lymphadenopathy. Hairy cell leukemia is not associated with lymphadenopathy. So, before we go further, let us have a look at features of hairy cell leukemia. Let us look at the features of hairy cell leukemia. First point, first point, 
Hedy cell leukemia, it is a B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is a B cell NHL. Next, most common clinical presentation. Most common clinically, it is associated with massive splenomegaly. It is associated with massive splenomegaly in absence of lymphadenopathy. Massive splenomegaly in absence of lymphadenopathy. These, these three words are important in absence of lymphadenopathy. Next point, peripheral smear is associated with pancytopenia. Fair enough. So, these were the first three options, pancytopenia, massive splenomegaly. Next point, put a double star on this and write down. Which mutation is detected in Hedy cell leukemia? It is. It shows the presence of BRAF mutations. Hedy cell leukemia shows BRAF, B-R-A-F, has to be remembered, has to be remembered, BRAF mutation. Next point. Next point, bone marrow biopsy. Bone marrow, bone marrow biopsy is a prerequisite. That means it needs to be done, which classically shows, uh -uh, which classically shows the presence of honeycomb or fried egg appearance. It is a prerequisite because it classically shows the honeycomb or a fried egg appearance. Why? Because imagine this is what hairy cells look like, cells with hairy cytoplasmic projections. So imagine many such cells lying together in the bone marrow biopsy, giving it the classical honeycomb or fried egg appearance. Why is bone marrow biopsy a prerequisite? because bone marrow aspirate is a dry tap. Bone marrow aspirate is a dry tap. That is why aspirated, nothing came out. It was a dry tap. Why? Because it is associated with bone marrow fibrosis. It is associated with bone marrow fibrosis. BMA, bone marrow aspirate is a dry tap because it is associated with bone marrow fibrosis. Last point, markers. Last point, markers in Hedy cell leukemia. They are CD19 positive, CD11C, CD25, CD103, and NXN A1 positive. Has to be remembered. Important there important. So, bone marrow biopsy, honeycomb or fried egg appearance. Bone marrow aspirate is a dry tap. Markers were, obviously it is a B cell neoplasm, so 19 would be positive. Others are 11C, CD11C, CD25103, CD11C, CD25103 CD and annexin A1 and annexin A1 massive splenomegaly in absence of lymphadenopathy. This is hairy cell leukemia. Next, this gets us to the next question that is question 61. This gets us to question number 61. Let us have a look at this. Which of the following is not a feature of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is associated with neurofibrillary tangles, senile neuritic plaques and amyloid and amyloidosis. That is okay, but it is not associated with Lewy bodies. So, question 61, the answer is D, that is Lewy bodies, that is Lewy bodies. So, let us have a look at Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's Starting with Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease, it is the most common cause of dementia in elderly. Most common cause of dementia, Alzheimer's, most common cause of dementia 
in elderly first point next next in young people in young the risk is increased risk is increased in down syndrome in down syndrome that is down syndrome it occurs in a younger age group next point next point grossly grossly it is associated with cortical atrophy grossly it is associated with cortical atrophy now when the cortex has undergone atrophy the sulci will widen up obviously with widening of cerebral sulci with cortical atrophy with widening of cerebral sulci the the sulcus of the brain they widen up so cortical atrophy with widening of cerebral sulci next point histologically or microscopically microscopically it is associated with the presence of neurofibrillary tangles microscopically it is associated with neurofibrillary tangles senile angiopathy senile angiopathy hirano bodies this again has been asked with alzheimers hirano bodies and coast tangles hirano bodies and coast tangles and coast tangles next point we have already discussed this in the previous questions plaques plaques and tangles they are more extensively found in hippocampus and amygdala they are more extensively found in hippocampus and amygdala and amygdala has to be remembered there is no shortcut to it has to be remembered plaques and tangles which are found in alzheimers they are more commonly seen in hippocampus and amygdala last point there is relative sparing of there is relative sparing there is relative sparing of which all structures are relatively spared primary motor there is relative sparing of primary motor and sensory cortexes primary motor and sensory sensory cortices so alzheimer's patient is he has good motor function and a good sensory function and there is also sparing of purkinje cells purkinje cells of cerebellum purkinje cells of cerebellum this is alzheimer's disease this is alzheimer's disease so it is not associated with lewy bodies next this gets us to the next question that is question 62 this gets us to the next one that is question number 62 now following type of cell is seen in we have already seen this is an rs cell the popcorn type of rs cell seen in lymphocyte predominant hodgkin's lymphoma the answer is d the answer is t that is lymphocyte predominant hodgkin's lymphoma we have seen this in detail so quick recap let us have a look at variants of rs cells variants of rs cells there are two main variants the first is the popcorn cell popcorn cell also called as lndh cell that is lymphocyte and histiocytic cell lndh lymphocyte and histiocytic cell seen in seen in lymphocyte predominant hodgkin's lymphoma seen in lymphocyte predominant hodgkin's lymphoma which was this question popcorn cell and the next variant is the 
lacunar type of RS cells, lacunar type of RS cells seen in nodular sclerosis, seen in nodular sclerosis Hodgkin's lymphoma, seen in nodular sclerosis. So, before we go further, let us see what they look like microscopically. Starting with the first one, that is, have a look at this. This is the classical RS cell. This is the classical RS cell, binucleate cell, prominent eosinophilic nuclei. Next, next, it is the same. In the previous slide, this area was magnified. It is the same classical RS cell seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma versus this one which shows a binucleate cell prominent nuclei with a clear rim of cytoplasm. This is the clear cytoplasm that is lacunar type of RS cells, lacunar type of RS cells seen in, seen in nodular sclerosis Hodgkin's lymphoma and the last is popcorn cell. This looks like a popcorn seen in lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. Popcorn cell seen in lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. Done. Next, this gets us, this gets us back to just a sec. Let me align this. Okay. So, this gets us to the next question that is question number 63. Question 63. Which of the following is not true with super antigens? Bind T cells irrespective of antigen specificity of T cell receptor? True. That is the main thing with super antigens. Bind directly to both MHC2 and T cell receptor causing T cell activation agreed. Bind to cleft or antigen binding room in MHC? No. No. It does not bind to the cleft. It binds directly. So, the answer is C binds directly to the lateral aspect of T cell. This is true. So, question 63, question number 63, the answer is C, which of the following is not true and not true is it binds to cleft. So, not true is it binds to cleft or antigen binding groove. Let me close this and restart just a sec. So, question 63. Let me restart this case. Okay. So, question 63. The answer is C. That is, it binds to the cleft or antigen binding groove or antigen binding groove in MHC2. This is false. It does not do so. It does not do so. So, before we go further, let us have a look at the super antigens. So, what do we mean by this? Again, an important topic, super antigens. Super antigens. First point. First point super anti antigens they cause non specific activation super antigens they cause non specific activation they cause non specific activation of t cells non specific activation of t cells so is it good or is it bad for the body this is harmful for the body this is harmful for the body. It causes a non-specific activation. So, this is harmful. Why? Because, because they do not, there is so much of activation that this in turn leads to this. The, so, let us start with the mechanism. Let us go point wise in super antigens. Let us start with their mechanism, mechanism of action. Firstly, they do not require antigen presenting cells. They do not require APCs. Next point, they do not bind to alpha chain of T cell receptor. 
they do not bind to the alpha chain of T cell receptor. You very well know that the most common T cell receptor 95 percent is the alpha beta. It has alpha chain and a beta chain. Normally, the antigens they bind to both alpha and beta chain, but this does not bind to alpha chain. This directly binds this directly bind beta chain of T cell receptor. This directly binds the beta chain of T cell receptor with alpha chain with alpha chain of the class 2 MHC. This statement is important mechanism they directly bind the beta chain with class 2 MHC this statement is important next point next point super antigens no co-stimulatory signal is needed no co-stimulatory signal is needed no co-stimulatory signal is needed this is the mechanism so so what does it lead to normally the antigens they bind to both alpha and the beta chain of t cell receptor alpha senora here only it is binding to the beta chain normally they need a co-stimulatory signal here it is not needed so this leads to this leads to release of cytokines and the main cytokine is interferon gamma leads to the release of cytokines main being interferon gamma and causes severe life threatening symptoms causes severe and life threatening symptoms causes severe and life threatening symptoms next point which are the diseases associated put a double star on this and write down diseases associated with super antigen production diseases associated with super antigen production so super antigens we have seen till now that they do not require MF APC they do not bind to the alpha T cell receptor chain they are not antigen specific they just lead to massive release of cytokines and chemokines most important being interferon gamma so which are the diseases associated the diseases are diabetes mellitus diabetes eczema this unfortunately has to be remembered guttate psoriasis diabetes eczema guttate psoriasis kawasaki disease kawasaki disease rheumatoid arthritis kawasaki disease rheumatoid arthritis toxic shock syndrome toxic toxic shock syndrome and infective endocarditis toxic shock syndrome and infective endocarditis these are the diseases associated with super antigens has to be remembered has to be remembered next next this gets us to the next question that is question 64 this gets us to the next one that is question 64 Rita a 60 year old postmenopausal female new onset uterine bleeding endometrial biopsy shows atypical hyperplasia atypical hyperplasia histological changes most characteristic of this are crowding of endometrial glands with budding and epithelial atypia this is what we mean by epithelial this is what we mean by atypical hyperplasia this is a factual question so question 64 the answer is a the answer is a that is crowding of endometrial glands that is crowding of endometrial glands with budding 
overcrowding of endometrial glands with budding and epithelial atypia with budding and epithelial atypia this is this is the classical feature of atypical hyperplasia this is the feature of atypical hyperplasias so before we go further before we go further let us have a look at the various microscopic features in this endometrial hyperplasia i can divide endometrial hyperplasia into several types so giving the heading as endometrial hyperplasia it can be of various types first is cystic hyperplasia uh, let's start with the first one let's go point wise the first is simple hyperplasia simple hyperplasia in simple hyperplasia histologically the glands they resemble proliferative type endometrium it resembles proliferative type endometrium it resembles proliferative endometrium this is simple hyperplasia next complex hyperplasia next is complex hyperplasia complex hyperplasia this has crowded endometrial glands this has crowded endometrial glands crowded endometrial glands with budding crowded endometrial glands with budding but no cytological atypia but no cytological atypia this is complex hyperplasia whereas atypical hyperplasia which was the answer to which was what was asked atypical hyperplasia this is associated with complex glandular crowding crowding of endometrial glands with clubbing but with budding this is the same crowding with crowded endometrial glands crowded endometrial glands with budding this point is the same associated with the next point is associated with cellular atypia this is important in complex the cellular atypia was absent there was no atypia whereas atypical hyperplasia is associated with cellular atypia next point next point coming to the last one that is that is endometrial adenocarcinomas coming to the last one that is endometrial adenocarcinomas these are obviously associated with stromal invasion these are associated with stromal invasion by malignant glands stromal invasion by malignant glands this is epithelial hyperplasia a very simple classification which we have done endometrial hyperplasia simple complex atypical and endometrial adenocarcinomas next this gets us to the next question that is question number 65 this gets us to the next one question 65 diagnose the disease from the alveoli the minute you see this you are able to see massively dilated alveoli alveolar dilatation making it classically emphysema so question 65 b emphysema in the previous question we have already seen the various types of emphysema centriacinar panacinar paraseptal and irregular so i am not going to get into the details of this again what is important is to differentiate emphysema from normal what you have here what you have here is the normal sequence of this is the normal 
sequelae or the normal sequence of lung which shows first identify lung by the presence of the alveolar septa all these are the thin alveolar septa with air in it making it as alveoli next what we see here is the terminal bronchiole going into the respiratory bronchiole alveolar duct and alveolar sac this is normal terminal bronchiole respiratory bronchiole alveolar duct and alveolar sac this is the normal sequence of distribution versus this image again identify lung by the presence of alveoli identify lung by the presence of alveoli showing irreversible showing showing irreversible dilatation distal to terminal bronchiole that is emphysema that is emphysema i hope none of you will get confused between normal and emphysema this is important to differentiate between the two next this gets us to the next question that is question number 66 the minute we see this even if i do not know that the question is from thyroid the minute i see this i can make out that this is the orphan anii nucleus seen in ptc papillary thyroid carcinoma so question number 66 question 66 the answer is a that is papillary thyroid carcinoma the answer is a that is let me close it and restart just a sec that is ptc papillary thyroid carcinoma what we see in ptc is the presence of orphan anii nucleus so question 66 a that is ptc the diagnostic hallmark the diagnostic hallmark of ptc is the presence of orphan anii nucleus orphan anii nucleus which shows a large clear nucleus with prominent nucleoli this is the diagnostic hallmark next point ptc it also microscopically is associated with semoma bodies microscopically it is also associated with semoma bodies semoma bodies can I, they are dystrophic calcifications, we will see it in the next question. Can I now safely say that femoral bodies are diagnostic of PTC? No, various tumors are associated with it. Let us see those. They are PTC, papillary thyroid carcinoma, next serous cyst adenocarcinoma ovary, serous cyst adenocarcinoma ovary, next RCC renal cell carcinoma meningiomas meningioma prolactinomas meningiomas prolactinomas and mesothelioma these are the tumors associated with the presence of semoma bodies next point so what we saw in the image was orphan anii nucleus which was diagnostic of papillary thyroid carcinoma next point investigation of choice for thyroid lesions let us see one more point here investigation of choice for thyroid lesions is FNAC fine needle aspiration cytology FNAC next point FNAC it can differentiate between all except it can differentiate between all except follicular neoplasms it can differentiate between all except follicular neoplasms that is it cannot differentiate follicular adenoma from carcinoma 
cannot differentiate follicular adenoma from carcinoma what do we need to make a diagnosis of follicular carcinoma we need capsular invasion we need capsular invasion or metastasis we need capsular invasion or metastasis so how do we diagnose ptc by orphan nai nucleus so this gets us to the microscopy of follicular neoplasms microscopy of follicular neoplasms let us see this follicular neoplasms follicular neoplasms wait now diagnosis this we have already seen emphysema next diagnosis let's be unbiased in this diagnosis what this shows here parent organ thyroid how do we know it is thyroid because of the presence of thyroid follicles with colloid in it making it as thyroid with all these are the orphan anii nucleus large clear nucleus prominent nucleoli this is what we are seeing everywhere orphan anii nucleus making it as ptc papillary thyroid carcinoma differentiated from this image this is again thyroid because of the presence of thyroid follicles which are of varying sizes some are very large some are intermediate sized with predominance of micro follicles all the others that you are seeing they are not the lymphocytes they are small small follicles with colloid in it i hope you are able to make it out in your ppt or in your app you have the presence of small micro follicles the field is full of them everything that is present in the background are all micro follicles so predominance of micro follicles predominance of micro follicles makes it a follicular neoplasm makes it a follicular neoplasm i do not know whether it is adenoma or carcinoma for that we need capsular invasion or metastasis next this gets us to the next question that is so question number 66 the answer is ptc papillary thyroid carcinoma meningioma shows whirling we'll see that later next this gets us to the next question that is question number 67 dystrophic calcification is seen in atheromatous plaques the answer is b dystrophic calcification it is seen in atheromatous plaques it is seen in atheromatous plaques so before we go further let us have a look at this calcifications they are of two types calcifications they are of two types dystrophic calcification dystrophic calcification and metastatic calcification dystrophic and metastatic calcification let us see the differences between the two and make a table here only dystrophic calcification it is seen in dead damaged or aging tissues it is seen in dead damaged or aging tissues versus metastatic calcification which is seen in normal tissues versus metastatic which is seen in normal tissues next point serum calcium levels they are normal in dystrophic versus elevated in metastatic calcification extremely important serum calcium extremely important next point dystrophic calcification the sites are the sites are or examples rheumatic heart disease atherosclerosis rheumatic heart disease 
atherosclerosis, TB lymph node, tumors, tumors. We have seen the list of tumors which are associated with semoma bodies. We just made it in the previous list. PTC, papillary thyroid carcinoma, serous cyst adenocarcinoma, ovary, RCC, mesothelioma, meningiomas, whatsoever, tumors. Next, next, Monkeberg medial sclerosis. Monkeberg's medial sclerosis. These are the diseases associated with dystrophic calcifications. Diseases with dystrophic calcifications versus metastatic calcifications versus metastatic which is seen in which is seen in hyperparathyroidism hyperparathyroidism next next resorption of bone resorption of bone which can either be because of multiple myeloma resorption of bone either because of multiple myeloma or skeletal metastasis. Resorption of bone because of multiple myeloma or skeletal metastasis. Just a sec guys, just a sec or skeletal metastasis. Next it is also associated with vitamin D intoxication and sarcoidosis vitamin D intoxication and sarcoidosis. These are the conditions associated with, these are the conditions associated with metastatic calcification. Last point, sites, let us write this here only, sites of metastatic calcification, where do they occur most commonly? The sites, they are, they are lungs which is the most common site lungs kidneys gastric mucosa lungs kidneys gastric mucosa and systemic arteries systemic arteries with pulmonary veins these are the sites of metastatic calcification important important so i can divide calcifications into two types dystrophic metastatic we have seen the conditions associated with each so the question was dystrophic calcification is seen in atheromatous plaques that was question 67 this gets us to the next one that is question 68 question 68. The death receptor pathway of apoptosis, it is initiated by interaction of CD95 with fast ligands. Question number 68. Question 68. The answer is A. This we have already seen earlier also. Question 68. The answer is A that is interaction of CD95 with fast ligands, interaction of CD95 with fast ligands. We have seen this just as a recap, the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, just as a recap, the intrinsic pathway, the intrinsic pathway, this is associated with release of cytochrome C from mitochondria. Intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, this is associated with release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria. Release of cytochrome C from mitochondria versus the extrinsic pathway versus the extrinsic pathway which is the fast fast ligand pathway which is the fast fast ligand pathway associated with interactions of cd95 with 
fast ligands. We have already seen this. Next, this gets us to the next one that is question 69. This gets us to the next question, question 69. Let us have a look at that. In lipooxygenase pathway, arachidonic acid products which have the help, help in the promotion of platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction. So, this is a very specific question concerned only with the lipooxygenase pathway and the answer is thromboxin A2. Easy one that is the answer is B thromboxins A2. The arachidonic acid metabolites, the, this is a topic that you study everywhere, you study it in biochem, physio, path, pharma. So, starting with arachidonic acid metabolites. Firstly, what is arachidonic acid? Arachidonic acid, this is Ecosa tetraenoic acid. Arachidonic acid, it is Ecosa tetraenoic acid. Ecosa means 20 carbon, tetra 4 in double bonds, in double bonds. So, it is a 20 carbon acid with 4 double bonds. What are the sites of double bonds? They are 5, 8, 11, 14. The sites of the double bonds, they are 5, 8, 11, 14, Ecosa tetraenoic acid. Next point, coming to arachidonic acid metabolites. Coming to the arachidonic acid metabolites. There are four pathways. The first is the cyclooxygenase pathway. The first is the cyclooxygenase pathway which leads to the formation of leukotrienes that is leukotriene B4, leukotriene C4, D4, E4 and lipoxins. You very well know this, nothing to explain, nothing to explain. Leukotriene B4, this is the most potent chemotactic agent. This is the most potent chemotactic agent. C4, D4, E4, they play a role in asthma. So, they cause bronchoconstriction and reduce mucus and increase mucus secretion. Leukotriene C4, D4, E4. Last is lipoxins. These are anti-inflammatory in nature. This is the only important point in this. Lipoxins, they are anti-inflammatory. So, there are three anti-inflammatory cytokines which are interleukin 10, TGF beta and lipoxins. Has to be remembered. Has to be remembered. The next pathway of arachidonic acid metabolism. So, the first one was cyclooxygenase pathway. The next is, uh, I am so sorry, this was the lipooxygenase pathway, leukotrienes B4, C4, D4, E4 and lipoxins. The next pathway is the cyclooxygenase pathway. The first one was the lipooxygenase pathway. The next is the cyclooxygenase pathway which leads to the formation of prostaglandins that is PGD2, PGD2, PGE2, prostaglandins, prostacyclins that is PGI2, prostacyclins and thromboxins and thromboxins. The name tells you thromboxins it is helpful in it or it is associated with thrombus formation. Thromboxins associated with thrombus formation. So, causes vasoconstriction. So, it causes vasoconstriction and increases incre and increases platelet aggregation. Thromboxins thromboxins, vasoconstriction and increases platelet aggregation. 
versus prostaglandins and prostacyclins which cause vasodilation and reduce platelet aggregation so they play an opposite role this is the cyclo oxygenase pathway so the second pathway of arachidonic acid metabolism cyclo oxygenase pathway the other two the other two are the epo oxygenase pathway epo oxygenase pathway uh, the, that is the third pathway of arachidonic acid metabolism epo oxygenase pathway it leads to formation of two metabolites 20 hete and eet 20 hete causes renal vasoconstriction it causes renal vasoconstriction so is responsible for hypertension 20 hete versus et which is the good guy so it is anti hypertensive anti apoptotic and pro angiogenic in nature pro angiogenic in nature this is the epo oxygenase pathway the last pathway is the isoecosanoid pathway isoecosanoid pathway remember chemistry we used to study isoforms cis and trans so isoecosanoid pathway it is the non enzymatic non enzymatic free radical based peroxidation non enzymatic free radical based peroxidation leading to formation of metabolites which cause hypertension leading to formation of metabolites which cause hypertension that is isoecosanoid pathway done done these are the arachidonic acid metabolites so this takes care of question 69 so easy one lipoxygenase which helps in promotion of platelet aggregation thromboxins this gets us to the next one that is question 70 question 70 which is required for differentiation of eosinophils we have already seen this in pathways of hypersensitivity type 1 hypersensitivity when we did that in detail the interleukins were interleukin 4 5 and 13 and we saw that interleukin 5 was the one which was predominantly involved in differentiation of eosinophils so the answer is d that is interleukin 5 interleukin 5 next next this gets us to the next question that is mhc class 3 gene encodes for firstly let us start with mhc the answer is b that is tnf tumor necrosis factor but this is an important topic so let us do this in slight detail let us do this in slight detail mhc major histocompatibility complex major histocompatibility complex or hla human leukocyte antigen what is the difference between the two HLA is only for humans whereas MHC is for all mammals we are human doctors so for us practically it's the same first point present on chromosome 6 short arm long arm short arm chromosome 6p next point what is the main role of MHC they present the antigen to the T cells so they have to be highly polymorphic in nature they are highly polymorphic highly polymorphic because they have to recognize a variety of antigens so they are highly polymorphic next it is of three types mhc 1 2 and 3 let us start with the first two that is mhc type 1 and type 2 this you very well know mhc type 1 and type 2 first point 
type 1 MHC, it is present on all nucleated cells and platelets. It is present on all nucleated cells and platelets versus type 2 MHC which is present on antigen presenting cells. Next point that is the which antigen presenting cells? The professional antigen presenting cells. Next point genes type 1 MHC it is first ranker so all the single digit genes that is MHC or HLA A, B and C genes producing it HLA, A, B, C versus type 2 where the genes are HLA, DP, DQ and DR, two digit genes DP, DQ, DR. Next point, next point the antigen presenting site, antigen presenting site in type 1 MHC it is rank 1 so everything is alpha 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 1 alpha 2 versus MHC 2 where the antigen presenting site is alpha 1 beta 1 this you very well knew I have not increased your knowledge by writing this what is important is MHC 3 extremely important MHC 3 MHC 3 MHC 3 it secretes MHC 3 it secretes TNF alpha it secretes TNF alpha tyrosine hydroxylase it secretes TNF alpha tyrosine hydroxylase HSP 70 HSP 70 that is heat shock protein HSP 70 that is heat shock protein 70 and complement factors and complement factors B, H and I complement factors B, H and I this list has to be remembered has to be remembered so the question was MHC 3 secretes and the answer was answer was TNF answer B TNF alpha done this finishes question 71